So my name is Hannah Tully, and I'm a pediatric neurologist, and I do both clinical work and research. So my clinical work involves general neurology, but also prenatal neurology. And my research is on hydrocephalus, many different types of hydrocephalus, but most recently a condition called post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, which affects premature infants. So for the study that I did, I looked at a big group of these kids. These are babies who were born, most of them premature, but not all of them. And they have a condition called intraventricular hemorrhage, which means bleeding inside the brain. Premature babies are particularly high risk for this. And among kids who get a severe form of hemorrhage, anywhere between 20 to 50 percent go on to develop what's called hydrocephalus. So among kids with severe hemorrhages, all of them dilate their ventricles, which are the fluid spaces inside their brain. All of them dilate them to some degree, but then there are kids who seem to work that out and the, the ventricles shrink back down and they're okay. Other kids, the dilatation just gets worse and worse and worse and then has to be surgically treated. So there's been a lot of research done about why intraventricular hemorrhage happens. And the rates for that have gone way down to in the 80s, it was about 50%, now it's something like 20% of these very vulnerable premature babies who get it. But the rates of post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus have been pretty constant. And nobody's really looked at what influences that process. So when you have the hemorrhage, why do some kids get better? Why do some kids get worse? And that's something we just don't know. There have been some small studies that have looked at that. And it's, it's definitely true that the worse the hemorrhage, the higher the risk of hydrocephalus. But what else is going on? So uh, this type of study is a really big one where it's kind of the 10,000 foot view where we're looking at a big group of kids from a database that's collected nationally from American Children's Hospitals. So there are 41 hospitals that contribute data to this database and then researchers like me can go and take a look which is a great way to kind of see patterns. It's sort of like looking at the landscape from high above. You can see patterns, you can see associations with that kind of number that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to pick up, but it's limited in detail because you can't dig down into the records of each one of these kids. So for this study, I used this database, the Pediatric Health Information System database, and we looked for kids who had intraventricular hemorrhage diagnosed within the first four months of life. Almost all of these, it happened early, but they had some long hospitalization. So as long as they got assigned a diagnosis code within four months, they were good. The data set was so huge that it crashed the computers. So we limited it further, so these kids had to have survived for a week. That shrunk the data set down to a mere 20,000 children. So we looked for tw these 20,000 kids, and we looked at many different factors. First, we categorized them as having hydrocephalus, and that was if they had been treated surgically for it, if they'd had a shunt placed, or if they'd had no surgery at all. We were relying on procedure codes, and it's sometimes a little hard to tell what exactly they meant by that procedure code. So if there was any ambiguity, we just didn't include them in the analysis. So we had our two groups, hydrocephalus, who was about 2,500 kids, and no hydrocephalus, who was the remainder. And we looked at many, many different factors sex, ethnicity, some maternal factors, and then we looked at some of the common things that happen to kids in the NICU, like illnesses that they undergo, sepsis, meningitis, that kind of thing, and then we looked at commonly used medications. And what I was particularly interested going into this study was medications that might exert effects on either blood flow or blood pressure or inflammation. Because the idea is that this is bleeding in your brain, so perhaps more bleeding or more uncontrolled bleeding would lead to hydrocephalus. Or it also seems to be an inflammatory process. So you have bleeding and then your brain, your immune system reacts to that. So medications that could potentially mediate inflammation could also play a role. So that's specifically the kind of things we were targeting. So I had help from a biostatistician with this because it's complicated. Not all of these kids survive and you don't want to say that a kid didn't get hydrocephalus because they live only two weeks, it wouldn't be fair to do so. So we did what's called a time-varying covariate analysis, a survival analysis, and followed these kids out for six months and then looked at risks, what are called hazard ratio, which is a form of risk for um, each one of these factors. So we looked at the factors individually, and there's lots of stuff that popped up. But a lot of these things happen together. 
at the same time. A lot of these medications are used together. So then anything that did pop up, we plugged those into what's called a multivariable analysis, looking, looking at them all at once and seeing what was still statistically significant. And that's the advantage of having a huge data set, is that you can do that kind of thing. A few interesting results from this. So almost 60% of the population was male. And it's known that boy babies get intraventricular hemorrhage more than girls. A lot of theories about why that is, but it's definitely an observation that's been shown time and time again. But, so more boy babies were in our study population because there were more of them with hemorrhage, but they were no more likely to progress to hydrocephalus than the girls. So once they had it, the same risk was there. Interestingly, ethnicity seemed to play a role. So Hispanic, <laughs> origin was associated with a very slightly reduced risk, about 20%. But Asian ethnicity was a risk almost 50% lower compared to whites. Um, that's interesting, and that's something that we'd seen in a few previous studies looking at a totally different set of kids. So I don't know why that is. I have some ideas, but I'm not, I can't tell from this study why. Some of the things like meningitis, such as infection of the brain, unsurprisingly led to a markedly increased risk of hydrocephalus. That probably kind of starts a cascading inflammatory process, so those kids are really sick. So no surprise there. Um, in terms of medications, lots of them popped up as significant at first, but the ones that stayed significant in our combined multivariable analysis were dopamine, which is a presser, and that was associated with a reduced risk, as were two anti-inflammatory meds. One's called indomethacin, and one's ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is Advil, but in babies, it's given for a different reason. It's given IV to try to close up when they have a connection in their heart called a ductus arteriosus. And in premature babies, sometimes that doesn't close. And it can cause stress on the heart and lungs. So they use this medicine and it actually tightens that up. So indomethacin is the other one that's used for exactly that same purpose. It's also used sometimes to try to prevent intraventricular hemorrhage. So both those medicines were also associated with quite a significantly reduced risk, about 30 to 40 percent. And that was accounting for lots of other factors too. So our analyses, we adjusted for gestational age, we adjusted the severity of IVH grade, we adjusted for the year the kids were born, we adjusted for where, they're tr where they were treated. So all those factors we took into account as much as we could, we still saw those results. So three medications, dopamine, indomethacin, ibuprofen, all showing that they're associated with a reduced risk. Does it mean that they cause, they cause things to be better? Can't tell, they're associated. So maybe something else is going on. Maybe these kids have something and they were treated with these medicines and they happen to be at reduced risk for hydrocephalus. So we can't tell that from this data, but it's intriguing enough and it's biologically plausible enough that these medicines could exert an effect that it's worth pursuing. So next steps for this. So as I said, this is the really high view where we're seeing patterns, but we can't see any detail. The next step is gonna be to look down, take a closer look at these kids. All right, I just published a study that looked at the kids who were treated in Seattle. And this kind of study, you don't have any statistical power to look at medicines because there are fewer, fewer, fewer kids. But what I was looking at was the inflammation pattern within their brains. And we saw something really interesting, that the kids who developed hydrocephalus, they all had what's called intraventricular obstruction. So inside their brain, inside the fluid spaces, things were kind of tightened down at very specific spots. Whereas the kids who had ventricular dilatation that got better didn't have that pattern. They just had kind of extra fluid everywhere, but it wasn't, it wasn't tightened up in any areas. That suggests to me that there may be a difference in inflammatory pattern between these two groups. One group is prone to get inflammation inside the ventricles and it scars down, and the other group isn't. So the next step will be to correlate, look at a larger group of kids, and see if that pattern, that difference in pattern, holds up, and then to see how that correlates with medication use. So that's what's next on my list.